Please pray with me, friends. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us this morning. Amen. So there are many Christians who say that the church shouldn't be political, that Christian faith isn't political. And that sure sounds nice to me. It sounds nice because it means that we can avoid tension, cast out potential conflict. I mean, honestly, who wants to have a good conversation at fellowship ruined by someone bringing up something controversial? Or who wants to have a good sermon ruined by the pastor mentioning something that's divisive? Unfortunately, though, uh, Jesus did not share our avoidance of controversy. The fact is that most of Jesus' teachings and actions in Scripture were divisive along religious lines, cultural lines, and political lines. And what's more, Jesus seems to be perfectly fine with this, with the controversial nature of what he said and did. Again and again, he told his disciples that they should expect people to get upset by the words they were preaching and the things they were doing. That doesn't mean that controversy is a good thing in and of itself. Of course, doesn't mean that Christians should uh, aim to be controversial for the sake of being controversial, but it does mean, I think, that when we hear things like, oh, the church shouldn't talk about that, shouldn't get involved in that, because that's controversial. Well, I don't think that's a very good reason in and of itself for Christians not to talk about something or get involved in something, because sometimes we're called to do things and say things that are controversial that at least some people will find controversial. And I think for followers of Jesus, that's just a given. Now granted, the statement that Christianity isn't political or shouldn't be political, I think is definitely true in at least one sense, in the sense of political partisanship. Right? In other words, Jesus is not calling all of us to be Democrats or all of us to be Republicans or Libertarians or members of any other political party. Jesus himself did not affiliate with any of the established political groups in his society, and we don't need to either. Most of all, because the will of God can never be equated with the will of any human-made, power-seeking political camp. Even, I would say, those that claim to be fighting for Christian values. That said, just because our faith isn't partisan doesn't mean that it isn't political. Let's take a closer look at our second reading this morning. Jesus is on trial right now, and he's having a private conversation with one of the most powerful politicians in the region. Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? In other words, do you think of yourself as being the king of the Jews? Mind you, there is no real king of the Jews anymore. There's a Roman emperor, and there are those who report to him. Jesus keeps uh, redirecting and short-circuiting Pilate's questions. Uh, It seems to me when I read this passage, Jesus doesn't have very much respect for Pilate as a leader, like he also didn't seem to have much respect for many of the religious leaders around him. And although he doesn't claim to be the king of the Jews here in this passage, Jesus does speak repeatedly about his kingdom, which is a political term, of course, kingdom. And actually, I think it's important to know that political terminology runs throughout the Gospels and throughout scripture, although often it's lost on us because in our modern American culture today, those terms don't have quite the same political connotation. I want to give you a few few examples here. In our first reading, Philippians 3, Donna read for us uh, what the Apostle Paul writes, that our citizenship is in heaven. Now, in Paul's day, the word citizenship meant Roman citizenship. 
It was one of the most important identity markers in that region of the world. You were either a citizen of the empire or you were not. And if you weren't, that had very real social and political consequences. Here in Philippians, Paul appropriates this political term, citizenship, and says that although he is in fact a Roman citizen, Paul is, he's saying that my citizenship, our citizenship, isn't really in Rome. It's in heaven. Another example of political terminology appears just a few words later for Paul. He writes, we await from heaven, we await a savior. Many Christians today think of that word savior as purely religious. It's an otherworldly term, right? A savior is someone who saves my soul for heaven after death. That's how many Christians think of it. But quite the contrary in Paul's day. As we heard on Palm Sunday, uh, when the Jewish people in Paul's day and for centuries before talked about awaiting a savior, they weren't talking about someone to rapture their soul into heaven. They were talking about someone who would bring political salvation to their lives on earth here and now. Savior was a political term for them. And even two of the terms that Christian tradition has made most central to belief in Jesus, the terms Lord and Son of God, both of these terms had a political connotation in the time of Jesus and of Paul. Not too long before Jesus was born, Caesar Augustus, the famous Roman emperor, began referring to himself as the Son of God. And this became a title used for the Roman emperor thereafter. And for many years later, when Christianity was in its earliest stages of developing as a movement, all Roman citizens were required to take an oath to the empire. And as they made this oath, they were supposed to repeat the words, Caesar is Lord which basically meant Caesar is master. Caesar is the highest authority in my life. The earliest Christians refused to take this oath, even in the face of immense persecution from the empire, for they proclaimed that their Lord, their Son of God, was not Caesar, but Christ. These two major terms, Lord and Son of God, friends, in the Christian tradition, they come not from abstract theological thinking. They come originally from concrete political resistance. From its very beginning, friends, our faith has been politically controversial. Let's go back once more to the private meeting between Jesus and Pilate. Notice that although Jesus claims to have a kingdom, and thus claims to be a political ruler of sorts, he says that his kingdom is not from here. This makes perfect sense when you read the rest of the Gospels. Jesus is always talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It's the subject about which he speaks most in scripture. So we can call Jesus a political ruler if we want. We could even call Christianity a political movement if we want. But we would need to note immediately thereafter that the ruler and the movement alike are not from this world. As Jesus mentioned several times to Pilate. But might that suggest that Christianity shouldn't be political? At least in most people's understanding of the word. I mean, sure, scripture uses all this political terminology we've been talking about, but it's using it to talk about the kingdom of God. Doesn't that separate for us these two kingdoms? Can't we be citizens in one and also citizens in the other and not worry about the two intersecting and influencing each other? Doesn't Jesus' talk about the kingdom of God divide for us the realm of faith in the realm of politics. Perhaps it would, except for one little thing that turns out, I think, to be one big thing. While Jesus tells Pilate that his kingdom is not from here, that doesn't mean that his kingdom is not coming here. 
In fact, that is one of Jesus' most frequent, most urgent messages. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is coming among you now, Jesus says again and again in the Gospels. And of course, in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, we pray every week, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. It is in this sense, friends, that our faith is and must be political. We are called, here and now, to work towards the reign of God, marked by justice and peace, compassion and hospitality, forgiveness and gratitude, and so much more. And because, as Paul writes, we are now citizens under that divine reign, we are called to orient every aspect of our lives, including our political opinions and actions, orient them around our allegiance to the God who is love, the God who we have come to know in the person of Jesus and in the words of Scripture. In closing, I'll just say that no one person can dictate what exactly this allegiance should look like. At least for Protestants, right? There's, um, there's no one to say, this is how your citizenship in God's reign should play out. Each and every one of us is free to discern for ourselves how the Spirit is leading us. Free to discern for ourselves what political speech and what political action God is calling us to. To share just one example for myself, I believe that our Christian citizenship compels us to be compassionate and hospitable towards immigrants who are vulnerable. In addition to the dozens of verses commanding precisely this in the Hebrew Bible, Jesus claims that allegiance to him requires allegiance to the least of these. So the way I see it, whenever the least of these are being targeted and vilified by modern-day Rome, I believe that followers of Jesus are called to choose compassion, to choose hospitality over the state and its agenda. That's what I believe. But of course, you can discern differently. You have the Spirit of God inside of you, and you can believe that God is calling you to work towards God's reign in different ways. But regardless, friends, God is calling you, calling all of us to work towards it. God is calling us, the church, to be political. May the Spirit of God be our guide. Amen.